Hello. Hello, Good everyone. Morning. How are you? You okay? Hope you guys uh, aren't as hungover as I am. Are you hungover? Yes? Good. They, if so they wait. were hungover, they would not be here. Fantastic. My name is Mike Butcher. I am uh, editor at large with TechCrunch. There's me up there. Oh, who's the hell? Um, can we get the fire turned up, please? Can you go like, that'd be cool. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for joining us. I'm here joined with Dave McClure, who's the uh, founder of 500 Startups, um, which is a accelerator of some note, I believe. Accelerator, incubator, shit show. Accelerator, Whatever. incubator, shit show. Thank you for clarifying that, like Dave. That. Um, we help startups, we hope. You help startups. We'll, we'll get in, getting into that. Um, 500 obviously came out a few years ago and you, um, you kind of um, rattled everything as up because, you know, the, the prior to that, the, the whole shtick of venture capital had been effectively, you know, slowly, slowly find your unicorn stuff. And you went we are, crazy. We are very value-added venture capitalists. We painstakingly talk to a thousand companies. We meet seriously with a hundred, we invest in 10. No, probably not. That's a bunch of bullshit. That, that, was the, that was the model. But you actually not only in trying to invest in, uh, well, meet 500 companies or 1,000 companies, but trying to invest in a 500 or 1,000 companies, right? Uh, we, we called the company 500 Startups. People used to say, was that the goal? And I was like, no, we want to invest in a lot more than 500. And people used to laugh at us. They still laugh at us. But people used to laugh at us just even thinking of investing in 500 companies being silly. We've invested in over 1,600 companies now. It's not quite so silly. We have probably three unicorns, about 40 other companies that we think could become unicorns. And generally, strategy is working. The, um, I think in a way, actually, you really um, picked up on something that was going on in Europe. And, and you're doing that right now as well, because um, Europe is a quite messy, complicated place. So many regions, so many countries, cultures, languages. And, and you really like to just find things which are you know, could be slightly hidden or uh, er, very much early stage companies. Right. I, don't, I don't think Europe is as messy as the rest of the world. Um, right, <laughs> fair comment. But I would I say five, six years ago, I think Europe was undercapitalized. These days, maybe that's less true. Um, but we thought there was a lot of opportunity investing outside Silicon Valley and outside the US. Uh, we started doing international investing from the very beginning, but we probably do about 30 to 40% of our investments but in 60 other countries around the world, and we've probably done close to 150 investments in Europe. You got, um, I think the exact figure is 143. 143, in ladies Europe and gentlemen. So far. Yes, okay. And you've got um, some of your top ones, like out of Europe, uh, Talkdesk, Udemy, and Intercom. Are they still European companies, or have well, you flipped them to the States? Yeah. I think all three of those companies these days would prefer to say that they're Silicon Valley companies, but. TalkDesk came out of Portugal, Intercom came out of Ireland, and Udemy came out of Turkey, and they still maintain pretty significant portions of their teams in those countries as well. So they're, they're European companies that are also Silicon Valley companies now. How do you deal, how do you source your companies? Do you turn up at Slush and, and have uh, minions uh, we, we run around We generally all places, go drinking and sing karaoke with them in unscrupulous bars all across the world. You as well. <laughs> Um, we, have, uh, we have people... That's how I find my companies. So I guess about half of our company, half of 500, is in California, but the other half is spread across 20 other countries. Uh, we do conferences, we do events, we do... You do uh, your own education. conferences. We do our own conferences. Um, we speak at other events, and we try and visit a lot of places around the world. We have people in many other metros. I mean, I think that's the important thing to emphasize, that it's not just Dave McClure. You have a whole team of people. You've got about two or three people in London right now, permanently, right? Uh, yeah, more like three or four and growing. Right. But um, yeah, there's about 140 people in 500 startups. Uh, when we first started six years ago, it was about five of us. 
Um, about 30 of those people are doing investments and the rest are sort of helping startups in various ways. Have you had, do you feel that um, when you've come into Europe, you've had a decent reception from other venture capitalists as well, or do they feel you're trying to uh, undermine them or any way, or do you have great <laughs> fellow travelers? Are you pissing uh, them off, Dave? Yes. Are you pissing them off? Uh, I don't know. We probably, I probably piss people off occasionally, but they seem to like our deal flow regardless. Uh, we're a pretty active investor at seed stage, and so most people downstream from us will still invest in our companies, even if they think I'm a loudmouth, obnoxious Yankee. Right. Um, but, you know, shout out to maybe folks, um, I think Saul Klein and Reshma and Carlos at Seed Camp were some of the original folks that we really got yeah. to know in London, actually probably around 2008 and 9. Mm -hmm. And then when we started 500 2010, we did a fair amount of investments with Seed Camp. Um, and we were, you know, have been pretty active angel, angel stage, seed stage investor mm -hmm. in a lot of European companies. What about in the Nordic regions? So in the Nordics, we've probably done about 30 companies over the last couple of years. In particular, maybe the last two years, we've done a lot. Yeah. Um, I think there's a ton of talent here, and obviously there's a lot of successful companies that have come out of the Nordics. Uh, I think we could probably still see more capital coming out of the Nordic environment. Uh, you, um, speaking of which, you did have a project which was branded as 500 Nordics 500 or 500 Nordics, I think. Yep. Um, yeah, actually, uh, well, Sean Percival and Sean Stina Percival. were working on raising a fund here, and we made some progress with that, but I would say we didn't get all the way there. Um, there's what, was a lot the, what was the, the problem? Uh, there's a lot of people who want to do country-based funds and vehicles, uh, specifically, you know, either for Sweden or Norway or perhaps others. Uh, we kind of feel like there's probably a larger market opportunity across the entire region, and it would not make sense for us to just Across the do, whole of Europe? Uh, either the, all or the Nordics, Nordics or yeah. all of Europe. I mean, 25 million people in the Nordics and maybe, you know, four to 600 million across Europe, depending on how you cut it. But doing one fund for a country of only, you know, five to ten million people. Well, I, yeah, because I, I was a bit confused when it was 500 Nordics was based out of Oslo. And with all due respect to Norway, it tends to be better known for oil than it does for startups. We, we did programs out of both Oslo and Stockholm. And right. we had people kind of around the area. But I think, you know, it seems like a lot of the activity is coming out of Sweden. But there's a fair amount of activity in Norway and Helsinki, Finland and et cetera, other yeah. places, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so do you think you'll revisit that then in the future? Uh, there's definitely a lot of talent here. We will keep investing in the region, whether we have a fund specifically for the Nordics right. or for the EU overall, we'll see. I, I think, you know, probably at some point having a fund that's EU focused broadly makes sense, but we yeah. might do... We might do country-based vehicles if there's a large enough critical mass. I think, you know, for so, countries of 50 million people or more, it might make sense. So the London office is really kind of like a feeder mechanism for the entire well, operation. we were going to have London be the central location for all of Europe, and then London decided to not be part of Europe. We decided to Why leave... Why the fuck did you do that? Well, like, I don't know. <laughs> British people just have terrible trouble with people with accents, uh, <laughs> as you could tell. And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. I'm... I'm personally so, extremely pissed off yeah. about Brexit. Who's pissed off about Brexit? Yes, now, I love was you. Was that the Brits or everybody else who's not British who was like giving that shit? Who's, who, who's <laughs> glad to see us go? Oh good, thank you. I was a bit worried then. Do you that's, know I that's love- That's the Irish, that's the Irish. Is the Irish over there. <laughs> the, um, yeah, we hate you too, no, I'm kidding. Um, Actually, can so, you keep the lights up so I can fucking see who's in the audience? Yeah. That's a, hi. Oh, there you, you are. Okay. Hello. <laughs> now, don't you think it's too dark at Slush? Goodness me, it's like being Mo at a drugged, up, day, most of the day drugged up rave party or something. That could be how much you were drinking last are night. Are they ha handing out MDMA at the door? Um, <laughs> that would probably <laughs> I, improve things. I um, don't know. Let's, let, let, let's be vaguely serious for a second now. So, okay, so you don't need to have a fund. You're investing regionally. Um, you're, you're, uh, you're, well, we I'm, can still, I'm we pretty can still sure we will, we will well, probably have a fund either for Europe or for UK or both at some point in the near future. Practical matter, if you're an entrepreneur in the room and you want to reach 500, what's the best way of getting in on your radar? The uh, best way you? is to build something useful that people are using or paying for. Yeah. Um, you can talk to any of the folks on our team or any of our founders. 
Uh, so probably the best way to get in touch with us is to have other existing 500 founders tell us that you're awesome. Yeah. And there's probably, I don't know, probably 3,000 people in the 500 founder community around the world. There's probably at least 300 in Europe. Yeah. So find a 500 startup investment, make friends with them, and then they'll become your PR advocates. I've, I've heard stream. beer and chocolate work really well. Beer, chocolate, and other substances. Um, <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> wanted, I wanted to um, know about... Um, so actually, what's interesting about what happened is that you've uh, actually done very well uh, with a few unicorn-type companies, Twilio, by the way, is heading for an IPO now? Twilio did go yeah. oh, did, IPO uh, did this IPO, summer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. Um, I, I mean, that was a really interesting journey because I remember like really when they were really, really young. And, yeah, actually, uh, I, I did the seed investment in Twilio when I was working at Founders Fund with Peter Thiel and Sean Parker. And, yeah. you know, three people, Jeff Lawson and his co-founder is in my living room. And now the company, I think, is 600 people doing close to $300 million a year in revenue, valued at about $3 billion. So, yeah. Pretty fucking amazing company and probably used by hundreds of thousands of developers. Speaking of Peter Thiel, um, <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned. Um, you were at a okay. web summit in, in uh, Lisbon recently and it was right after the election in the US. Um, and you uh, had a yeah. very big outburst on stage, which, uh, which was kind of understandable for someone who you know, was a um, supporter of Hillary Clinton. And you said, if you're not Fucking, fucking pissed right now. What is wrong with you? What is fucking wrong with you if you're not pissed right now? What, we provide communication platforms to the rest of the fucking country and we're allowing shit to happen just like the cable news networks, just like talk radio. It's a propaganda meeting. Dave, Pro right, let's unpack medium, that. Medium. What, what you, what, what, let's now in the kind of more um, sober environment, vaguely sober environment of... Of here, let's unpack what you think okay. went wrong and what did the technology industry do wrong and not contribute? Uh, so first of all, I was probably a little emotional that morning. I had not slept, I thought. A little is an understatement, <laughs> I think. Uh, I was distraught. I was very, uh, I was very angry, I was very ashamed, I was very sad. Like, you know, I, I think the, the words that I used was, we were raped, we were robbed, and I think what I meant was the opportunity to inspire a generation of, you know, women and people was missed. Um, I think Hillary Clinton would have been an amazing president that would have, you know, kind of continued the opportunity to expand people's imaginations about who can be leaders for the country. So with Barack Obama becoming the first African-American president, Clinton becoming the first female president, I think there is a lot of inspiration and opportunity. Um, obviously, that did not happen. Uh, some of the reasons that didn't happen, I think, were possibly because half of the American electorate didn't know what the fuck that they were doing. But well, to what extent do you think um, things like fake news um, on social media contribute to the issues? I think and it contributes a lot. do you think lot. that Zuckerberg's statement about how fake news wasn't influencing, and we, you know, it wasn't us, guys, um, do you think Look, that's credible? I, I think Zuck's an amazing entrepreneur and generally a good human being. I think he was full of shit when he said that. And I think there's no way in hell that you could say that Facebook is not an influential platform that has impact on every person in the world, arguably, or at least a billion people. Um, and to suggest that somehow Facebook doesn't have impact on the American electorate in deciding election was completely bullshit. There's no way that that's true on the face of it. I think he even would not say that now. I mean, they're supposed to be able to influence us on, on our buying decisions. Surely they must be influencing on, us on our news I mean, consumption. It, this is not limited to just Facebook. And I think, you know, all of these social media platforms, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, whatever, um, you know, have a responsibility to help produce content, journalism, media, whatever, that educates and informs and connects as far as Mark is concerned. And I, I think there are plenty of other people inside Facebook who also feel that way. Uh, turns out that they were working on a news tool that would have helped identify fake news, which they chose not to roll out 
for I don't know fucking why, except that maybe it might have more negatively impacted conservative news sources, but still, you know, not even talking about opinion, but just talking about verifiable news sources and information, things, you know, websites that are less than 30 days old with a single article with clearly inaccurate information were being presented as news sources that millions of people read. That is fucking bullshit. That is a solvable issue. And if we as technology entrepreneurs and citizens of the world don't feel that that's our responsibility to provide to every person on the planet, like, I don't care whether you're like a fuckhead on the left or the right, you should identify false news sources. You can probably come up with information tools that help identify opinion as well, and maybe even opinion that's possibly not correct. That one's tougher. But clearly there are bullshit stories that had massive influence out there. Millions of people saw those things. Mm. And this isn't to say that, you know, Fox fucking news hasn't had that impact for 20 years. But still, Facebook is one of the largest news sources on the planet, if not the largest news source on the planet. I mean, to what extent do you think it's the own, on the onus of the technology community to get involved in an issue like that? It's absolutely on the fucking responsibility you know, of the technology it's not our community. Problem. Absolutely. Like, whether you think you're a media company or not, you know, whether it's the fourth estate or whatever, you know, you're, you're producing a product which you are making millions, billions of dollars off from. You better fucking be taking care of humanity. One of the you issues. You better take it seriously. I think they do take it seriously. I just think they weren't paying that much attention and all of a sudden, like, oh, some shit happened that probably could change the course of human history for the next four to 20 years. Jesus, maybe we were slightly responsible. Were we fucking asleep at the wheel? Let's, well, let's be honest. The... Uh, you know, the regulation aspect of, uh, say, internet access or uh, how things will play out over the next few years, the control of the Supreme Court, uh, is spying, spying into, into, you know, internet access, etc. We're, we're likely to have a conservative, we may only have three houses of republic controlled, like, you know, legislative and Congress and judicial branch, but we are definitely going to have a conservative court for probably the next 10 to 20 years. Interesting. Interesting times. Um, the, Sorry, the I know you guys don't necessarily give a fuck about all this, but it's not just a U.S. issue. It's not just a Trump and Clinton issue. This yeah. is an issue in the U.K. with Brexit. It's an issue with Le Pen in France. It's an issue with Erdogan in Turkey. It's an issue with Putin in Russia. It's an issue here in Finland because you're right next to fucking Russia. It's an issue for all of Europe. It's an issue for Duterte in Philippines. Like, we cannot let dictators who use social media like influence poorly educated electorate. We have to educate the electorate about what the fuck is going on. Yeah. We cannot let liars like Trump go unchallenged just because they're good at social media does not mean that they should lead the fucking country. We should challenge them. We should inform the rest of the electorate. Yes, we should provide jobs for people. Yes, whatever. But we should not allow racist, sexist, old people who are not informed decide the future of our country and our planet. Wake the fuck up. Get involved. Make a difference. And, and talk to your friends and family who live in other places. I was born in West Virginia. West Virginia voted fucking 70% for Trump. I got a lot of work to do with my cousins, my relatives. Hopefully, you know, some of them will come around. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting time, anyway. I think, in the next few years. You're absolutely right. Um, Peter Thiel was famously the, an investor and uh, is a famous investor and is now <laughs> Peter Thiel the only is a famous investor guy. and a very smart person and I have worked for him twice, how once at you, PayPal and once at Founders. How Club. do you think it's going to play out over the next few years? He's got the ear of Trump. He's an enormously influential person in Silicon Valley and pr basically the world now. Um, are people going to work with Peter Thiel? Will entrepreneurs still go to him with uh, deals or, yes. or not? I mean, I, I think Peter's a really smart person, and this whole issue aside over the last, you know, three, six months or whatever, you know, Peter was a, a very, what I think was a good person running PayPal, and I think he's generally been thoughtful and caring for his employees of all colors, creeds, religions, whatever. Uh, I think Peter made an incorrect decision. Um, Do you, you know, think he'll I think be punished he, for that? Sorry, I, I think, to be clear, Peter made a smart decision from an economic 
betting standpoint. Yeah. I don't think that it's okay to make that bet because of the moral implications of that for women, for Hispanics, for African Americans, for uh, Muslims, and for LGBT community. I think there's too many things that are fucked up about that, that regardless whether you agree or disagree with Trump's politics, it's not okay to support leaders who do shit like that. And particularly in Silicon Valley, I think there's a lot of people who feel that way. And so, right or wrong, Peter's probably gonna feel the blowback of being right about the election, but being wrong about the morals and leadership of the country. And the long-term implications, I suppose. I think if Clinton had gotten elected, this might have blown over. The fact that like Trump got elected, Peter was right, Peter's on the transition team. I mean, I hope that Peter has a positive influence on policy that Trump is going to be implementing. Right. Um, but still, I think a lot of people in the Valley are going to question, you know, is it okay that you were smart and right, but maybe not representing the values that Silicon Valley holds dear? And do you think um, that has implications for the rest of the world? How do you think, uh, do you think that uh, uh, the world is going to tighten up? There's, perhaps there's going to be more startups around privacy and uh, secure communications. Yeah, I think that was already happening. But I mean, there's going to be challenges with immigration in the U.S. There's going to be, frankly, it's an opportunity for a lot of entrepreneurs who might have come to the U.S. to do those businesses elsewhere. Yeah. Um, do you think there'll be U.S. entrepreneurs coming to other places, just leaving the U.S. and getting out and I doing mean, other things? maybe a few, but not that much. As much as people talk about leaving and going to Canada, still, yeah. you know, there's a lot of talent in Silicon Valley. Those are people who want to come to Silicon Valley. That's still going to happen, even if we make it hard for immigrants to come to the country. Yeah. Um, and there's still going to be a lot of innovation that's going to be coming out of Silicon Valley. It's not the only place, but, no. you know. You're making quite big bets in Asia, for instance, aren't you? I mean, 40%, 30 or 40% of our investments are outside the U.S., but still more than half are inside the U.S., and most of those are in Silicon Valley. You know, so exactly. there's still going to be a lot of people, you know, again, right or wrong, who are going to come to Peter and Founders Fund for money because they are smart people and they yeah. generally have done a great job, you know, backing and investing in entrepreneurs. Um, and that's not going to change. Where, uh, in the sort of closing stages, where do you, what, do you, what interests you right now in terms of your investing in your portfolio? Uh, it, people talk a lot about artificial intelligence, about the future of autonomous cars and autonomous ro robotic uh, stuff like that. Is that something that you would like to play in at the seed stage, or is um, it? I think there's lots of people who are very talented at doing those types of businesses. I think Elon uh, and Travis and many others have been like fabulously successful in creating those types of uh, opportunities. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to get the yank here in just a second. Um, I think what excites me is actually just providing goods and services for consumers and businesses globally and doing that in many, many other countries yeah. uh, where there are lots of brown and yellow and other non-white colored people doing cool shit. Right. Um, and we hope to do a lot more of that. Well, Dave McClure, it's been an absolute pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave McClure, 500 Startups. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And I hope to see you guys at TechCrunch Disrupt next week in London. See you later. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, David and Mike. That was very entertaining indeed. Fuck yeah, that was fucking eloquent. <laughs>